Fan-made modifications, or mods as us video game experts call them, are a way for the more creative corner of the player base to tweak or add to the game. Usually mods are limited in their scope or ambition, adding just a handful of levels, characters or items. That's because they're made by a few fans in their bedrooms rather than a fully staffed video game studio complete with standing desks, colourfully decorated break rooms and casual Fridays. In a modder's bedroom, every day is casual that day. Some mods though set their sights on something far more ambitious than just adding top hats and monocles to all the mud crabs, if you can believe it. These exceptional fan-made add-ons transform the titles they're based on so comprehensively that you'll probably need access to the original game's dental records to identify them. Consider these seven such fan mods that made the game they're based on totally unrecognisable. The original Castlevania, released for the NES in 1986, sees you playing as Simon Belmont, a vampire hunter whose goal is to break into Dracula's home and whip him to death for vampire crimes. It was great, obviously, and led to countless spin-offs, sequels and, along with Metroid, even half of a genre name. But it wasn't until 2017 that it spawned a fan mod for id Software's iconic shooter Doom, one which turned Doom from a hell-based shoot-'em-up into a full first-person conversion of the original Castlevania. Called Castlevania Simon's Destiny, this conversion, made using the open-source GZ Doom engine, recreates the entirety of Castlevania as a first-person shooter, letting you see exactly what it would look like if you were going around whipping bats to death. Interesting, I see. It's incredibly detailed and obviously a labour of love from the developers. Every environment, enemy and weapon from the original game is in there, right up to the final confrontation with your boy Dracula himself. So ends the great battle. <laughs> While it does regrettably now include the bane of most gamers' existence, first-person platforming, I think we can give it a pass on account of one, it's Castlevania, and annoying platforming is kind of its thing, and two, this music. Hats off to the developer though, I mean, what's next, Super Mario Doom? Oh, fair enough. Long before Fortnite was even a twinkle in the eye of industry giant Epic Games, Epic gave us the influential Unreal Tournament series. Like Fortnite, the Unreal Tournament games were multiplayer shooters. Unlike Fortnite, there were no funny dances. Unless, let me try one now. Nope. The overarching premise of Unreal Tournament was a future in which the New Earth government legalised a gladiatorial-style death sport to distract humankind from its grim reality. I guess no one told them they could just make a documentary series about a weird dude who has tigers. But the setting mattered less than the fast and furious fragging, or Unreal Tournament's abundant support for fan-made mods. From that prolific modding scene came Killing Floor, a total conversion mod for Unreal Tournament 2004 that transformed the fantasy multiplayer deathmatch arenas of that game into an urban wasteland peppered with zombies. Better yet, that urban wasteland was specifically the grimy, zombified wreckage of London, furnished with London icons like double-decker buses, red phone boxes and rain. Ah, the sound of home. The initial version, released by modding team Chatterline Productions, had a short but atmospheric story mode in which you, a disaster response force soldier, fought to survive the outbreak. However, the main event of Killing Floor was the intense co-op survival mode in which you fought back wave after wave of enemies. This 2005 mod arrived in a sweet spot for zombie demand, a few years after the similarly London set 28 days later, a few years before the superlative Left for Dead, and at a point in human history where wave-based horde modes were still fresh and exciting. So 
impressive was the mod that Killing Floor got a standalone retail release in 2009 with the help of development studio Tripwire Interactive, which then spawned a sequel game Killing Floor 2 in 2016, where the zombies had made it all the way to Paris. Better weather at least. <laughs> For our money, Tokyo remains the most futuristic city in the world, but there have been plenty of pieces of science fiction that asked the earth-shattering question, what if Tokyo was a little bit more futuristic? Let your imagination go wild, people. Neo Tokyo, a multiplayer mod for Half-Life 2, attempted to answer exactly that question, swapping the sort of totalitarian Prague vibe of the original game City 17 for the building-sized neon signs and high-tech weaponry of a Tokyo 30 years in the future. Though given that the mod was released in 2009, that means it's only 18 years in the future now. I'd better start stocking up on submachine guns. The mod had a similar feel to Counter-Strike, another famous Half-Life series mod, with its round-based respawning and selectable classes, but aesthetically this was even more starkly different from the game it was based on. Not that it's necessarily a particularly original aesthetic. This Neo Tokyo mod is inspired by Ghost in the Shell in the same way that the movie Transmorphers is inspired by Transformers. Still, in the absence of a decent Ghost in the Shell game since the PS2 era, you could do much worse back in 2009 than to play a few frantic rounds of Neo Tokyo, with its levels based on previously serene Japanese gardens, gleaming science labs and high-speed bullet trains. Neo Tokyo was successful enough and changed Half-Life 2 comprehensively enough that it was even released as a free-to-play standalone mod on Steam, where it's still available to download today. The bad news is that over a decade later, the servers are about as lively as Saturday night at the morgue. Oh well, back to watching sci-fi movies I guess. I've heard this Atlantic Rim is supposed to be really good. Despite all the alien nightmare creatures, Half-Life 1 wasn't really what you'd call a horror game. Half-Life 2's Ravenholm level was when horror really arrived in the series, and even then you could undercut the scares by using a gravity gun to kill zombies with a toilet. Clearly this lack of full-on scares bothered the creators of the Half-Life 1 mod Cry of Fear, because they took the bones of the original Half-Life and reimagined it as a cinematic survival horror game heavily inspired by Resident Evil, Silent Hill and that one nightmare I'm always having where I'm walking down a long, dark corridor and suddenly get jump-scared by a screaming face. <coughs> yes, that's the one. Cry of Fear is a substantial offering, a full 8 hour experience for single player or co-op in which you play as a young man who wakes up after being hit by a car in the middle of the night. You then have to try and make your way home through a cold Scandinavian city that is way more full of horrible twitching nightmare creatures than you were probably expecting, or indeed hoping. Along the way you'll solve puzzles, fight enemies and switch between normal levels and nightmare levels, like in Silent Hill, although to be fair, the regular levels are more than nightmarish enough. Thanks. Cry of Fear was released as a mod in 2012, but its popularity, along with updates to the actual Half-Life version available on Steam, making Cry of Fear incompatible with the base game, meant that it was released as a standalone game a year later. Standing alone, ironically, is what I'll be doing in this corridor, because there's no way I'm going any further. That's enough horrible monster babies with knives. Thanks. Id Software's follow-up to Doom, Quake, was a lot of things. A pioneering move into three dimensions, a bold step forward in multiplayer gameplay. Brown. Very brown. What it wasn't, unfortunately, was much of a laugh, coming as it did during the grim dark latter half of the 90s, when no one would take your game seriously unless you could kill a dog in it. To counteract that, we have the mod Quake Rally, 
which reimagines Quake as a fast-paced, arcadey racing game in which, instead of controlling a grimacing square-headed space marine, you are instead in charge of a series of souped-up vehicles with flame decals painted down the side. And you just zoom around various custom maps designed to provide racing thrills rather than life or death struggles against Lovecraftian monstrosities. Those after more competition can also use weapons, and this being Quake, we're not talking green shells and banana peels, but nail guns and rocket launchers. You can still take damage from crashing into walls, and it's probably an idea to avoid driving into large pools of molten lava. That's good advice for all driving games, though, and real world driving. Just good advice generally. I go by many names in this city. Outlaw, rogue, thief. The few people who know me call me Corbin. My job is to acquire valuable items for the rich. Sounds easy, but these items are usually owned by someone already, someone who doesn't want to part with them. Having played through the entirety of Doom 3, we can categorically state that the last thing it needed to be was more dark. <laughs> Look, I know there's a demon invasion going on, but is no one replacing these light bulbs? You'd be forgiven, then, for thinking you could give the Doom 3 fan add-on called The Dark Mod a miss, given that it sounds an awful lot like six hours of staring at a black screen. In fact, the purpose of The Dark Mod was to recreate the classic Thief series of stealth games as faithfully as possible by shamelessly borrowing the setting, the visual style, the gameplay mechanics, many of the weapons and items, the interface, the hero character's voice acting, the cutscene style, the fonts. You know, there's an irony here somewhere. The Dark Mod was a thief game in all but name, and as such is totally unrecognisable from the sci-fi shooting of the game it's based on. What it benefited from was the fact that the Doom 3 engine, id Tech 4, was particularly good at rendering dynamic light and darkness, which makes it perfect for Thief's trademark shadow skulking gameplay mechanic. Besides, you could definitely forgive the mod team for building it. When the mod released, it had been five years since Thief Deadly Shadows and would be a further five years before 2014's Thief reboot. Worse still, when that finally did come out, it was 2014's Thief reboot. You had to be nicer with the ladies. That's right, Garrett. Let him get a really good look at your face. The Dark Mod is arguably a far more faithful sequel to Thief Deadly Shadows, and with a huge selection of fan-created maps to download and development that was active as recently as last year, it's got a lot more longevity too. If you're curious, nowadays you can still grab the Dark Mod as a freely downloadable standalone release. That's right, the mod team has somehow avoided any lawsuits or cease and desist letters from Thief series rights holder Square Enix for well over a decade. Ooh, maybe they just hid in a dark corner or something. A robust legal defense. That was my job. Fossil finder. Bone digger. Paleontologist. But while I was digging in the dirt, Hitler and his gang of gene scientists went all in. They brought him back in the flesh. As established earlier, Half-Life 2 did indeed include horror elements, but by the time it came out, people had moved on, Grandad. What was hot now was dinosaurs, and do you see any of those in Half-Life 2? Not even close. Luckily, the ever-vigilant modding community was ready to leap into action, and the result was the totally bizarre mashup Dino D-Day, a team-based multiplayer shooter whose historical thesis is that the Axis powers resurrected dinosaurs and pressed them into service for the Nazis, which is ludicrous because dinosaurs hate fascism. They'd never go for that. They even weaponized the gentle herbivorous Dismatosuchus by mounting a 20mm cannon on its back, the poor thing. The T-Rex with guns in its mouth I'm less bothered about, but only because it's awesome. A straightforward military shooter in all but one crucial regard, the wildcard element introduced by the dinosaurs is what makes Dino D-Day so interesting and so totally different from the original game it was a mod for. In fact, Dino D-Day proved to be so intriguing that it too earned itself a standalone release in 2011, consisting of five maps and three game modes – Team Deathmatch, King of the Hill, and Objective Mode, which gave players specific tasks such as trying to stop a Styracosaurus with a Panzer IV turret mounted on its back. 
yeah, good luck with that. Thank you so much for watching this video. We had a lot of fun making it. Hopefully you had a lot of fun watching it as well. And if you'd like to see more of this sort of thing, it's easy. Just click the subscribe button and click the little bell icon to be notified every time we make a video. It's that straightforward. Also, if you'd like to see something right now, we've got another couple of videos up here. Uh, at the top is one from us and at the bottom is one from our sister channel Outside Extra. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time.